First of all, raise your hand if you value friendship. Just raise your hand. This one might get you in trouble, but raise your <coughs> hand if you do anything for your friend. Raise your hand, please. Excellent. Um, oh, there you go. So, imagine this, picture this. You are over here and you're walking along and you've got your head in the clouds. You're loving life, golf's good, crayfish is great. And your friends are all, you know, you're enjoying your friend's company. But over here, picture this, you've got a friend. They're under a dark cloud. They're going through a relationship problem. They're going through mental problems, mental stress, mental episodes. They're having problems at home, they're having problems with the bank. So you're over here with your head in the clouds, enjoying life, loving life. They're over there under a dark cloud. What information could I share with you today to close that gap? What information could I share with you today that could potentially save someone's life? And what if it was yours? And what if it was as simple as a 10 or 20 minute conversation? Today I want to talk to you about mental health. And it's said in the next 12 months, one in five Australians could experience a mental episode. 20% of all Australians in the next 12 months could experience a mental episode. But get this, in a lifetime, it's said that 50% of all Australians will experience a mental episode. So it's one in two people. So just take a second to think about that. Have a look at the person beside you. Because if it's not them, potentially it's you. You might be wondering who I am and, and what's the beacon fight for life? How did it come about? And why, is it so, why, why am I so passionate about telling this story? For me to do that, I need you to come back with me to 2011, September 2011. And you can probably all relate since I'm sitting in my office. I've got a mountain of paperwork. I've got emails, you've got your mobile phone, you've got your desk phone. And then back then there was even a, there was even a fax. And who remembers a fax? <laughs> <laughs> um, and my, my, my desk phone rings and it's my PA. And it's, it goes something like this. Michael's here. Okay. I don't recall him wanting to come and see me. Yeah, okay, send him up, send him up. Uh, buzz me in five minutes because I've got to go, I've got to go do something. Put the phone down. Michael, how are you, mate? Hello. Geez, you're looking a bit shabby. What's going on? Oh. I don't know, mate, I'm not feeling too good. Oh, my, my missus has left me. The bank's chasing me for money. And uh, I lost my job. I told my boss to stick his job up his ass. I was like, whoa, that's all happened, has it? Jesus, mate, that's a bit rough. Yeah, but you're right, mate. Come on, I've got to go. I've got to go pick up the kids. But yeah, but you're right, mate. And I pushed him out the door. I pushed him out the back and literally pushed him out the door. And I didn't think another thing about that conversation. Now I need you to fast forward for me 72 hours. I get another phone call. It's for, for uh, my friend Paul Paul. Paul's been my mate for 25 years. Or longer now. And the call goes something like this. Hey Paul. How are you mate? Good. Yeah, yeah. How's the family? Great. Yep. I can remember it vividly. Yep. Well, Michael, yeah, he came to see me the other day. Oh, shit. I forgot to ring him back. I was going to talk to him about that. I was just so busy. You what? That call left me in a state of shock. Michael went home and took his own life. And the worst thing was that um, Michael would have done anything for me. And he had at times done that for me. Did you know that suicide is the leading cause of death for all men 15 to 44 in Australia? When I started looking at this tragedy back then, it was six or seven people a day were taking their own life. Up until just recently, 2019, it was nine people a day were taking their own life here in Australia. Seven people, seven are men, 
two or three. Indigenous people are three times more likely to take their own life. Raise your hand if you know someone that's suicidal. Please keep your hand up. Now raise your hand if you know someone that knows someone that's suicidal. So let's have a look around the room. Look how significant suicide is in your community. 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. And on a global scale, 800,000 people a year take their own life. For every one person that takes their own life, it's one person every 40 seconds, another 20 people attempt suicide. So it's something like 16 million people a year around the world take their own life. So you ask me why I'm so passionate about talking about this and sharing my message. Like Bill was talking about as individuals what we can do to look after ourselves. My message is about being aware of your surroundings, being aware of your friends, your colleagues, those people that you work with, that you play golf with, that you go to the gym with, that you play yoga with, or you do yoga, if you can do yoga. Um, <laughs> I've seen an interview, it was in 2013, it was from, a, I won't mention the name, it was across this call centre. What they did successfully was they took 800,000 phone calls. In one, only 12 months, in 2013, they took 800,000 phone calls. And out of those, they, uh, and, uh, across this call uh, centre can take up to 150 calls. One person can take up to 150 calls a day, and one in 50 calls is suicide related. But what they didn't do was they missed 167,000 calls. So successfully answered 800,000 calls, missed 167,000 calls. So my mates come to me, reached out, potentially I'm the uncle, I did miss the signs. He's gone home, made the call, and his phone call could have been put on hold. And he may never have got the chance to talk to someone. And he took his own life. Now I'm not saying that's what happened, potentially that could have happened. So I ask myself, am I doing enough in my community? Am I doing enough as an individual? Because you've got these great centres that you can you can go online, you can you can make phone calls, but un unfortunately not everyone's getting getting spoken to or talked to. So why not let's go back to the, the good old face-to-face -face conversation? So I've come up with a five-step plan. Now it's not rocket science, and the reason I've made it so simple is because I want everyone to be able to adopt it. Now I know this isn't for everyone. Not everyone has the empathy or the sympathy to be able to talk to people. But at least if you know that someone's struggling, maybe you could let someone else know if you could potentially help that person. So, we'll just start. Bill's gonna be my sexy cameraman. <laughs> or cameraman. Can you please dance? <laughs> 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 Is that work? Huh? Yeah. Right. So I've got a, a uh, PowerPoint. So what it goes through is that really it just introduces myself and Troy Coward. Troy Coward is a close friend of mine and he's also a co-founder of the Beacon Fight for Life. And it just so happens Tonight, Troy will be on a current affair at seven o'clock, and he'll be telling his story about why he's so passionate and why he helped co-found the Beacon Fight for Life. As before, Troy, um, Phil spoke about individuals and what they can do to look after their mental well-being. I speak about being around, identifying your surroundings and understanding what's going on with the people in your immediate circle. Troy, unfortunately, his father took his own life when he was 15. So he talks from, from, a, from a place that living with the after effects of losing someone to suicide, especially someone close to the father. Um, he then went on to win a, I think a state title as a boxing, which is something that was dear to his father to um, hold respect for him. So, we're going short. <laughs> you <laughs> You used up all the laptop. Okay, so our mission statement for the Beacon Fight for Life is to reconnect the Australian and multicultural communities by raising awareness through education, communication, 
dance and celebration. To reduce the numbers significantly, to, to significantly reduce the number of people taking their own life in Australia. And these, these simple methods will inspire people to choose life. Our outcome is to reconnect the Australian multicultural community and to reduce the amount of people taking their own life. But our vision is for all people to be able to talk openly and seek help if they're feeling suicidal or having a mental episode. And again, our goal is to reduce the amount of people taking their own life in Australia, the number of people. So with the five-step process that I'm about to... Uh, okay. There you go. Well, that was Troy. It's a video that we were playing with. Um, that's our mission statement. As I said to you before, our the outcome of our vision, our goal, now... Before I go into the five steps, remember your safety is priority. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, that, is, is being aware of your surroundings. But, and you may not, it may be someone that you know, or it may not be someone that you know. But we're never going to put ourselves at risk. If someone's in a crisis and needing help, there are solutions and ways that we can help them. But it doesn't necessarily mean we have to thrive them anywhere or we'll be part of their um, So number one, how to identify a friend and colleagues experience a crisis? Well, being aware of our surroundings. So when you're going, as I said before, going to golf, leaving at home, someone's spending more time in their bedroom, someone's not coming to the men's shed, or, um, or just with, withdrawn. So understanding, you know, like if, if it's one in two people in a lifetime are going to experience a mental episode, you never know when that's going to be. And so just identifying it, like I missed the signs, don't be too busy. Mr. Simon. Number two, again, this is extremely important. Each of these steps are extremely important, but listening non judgmentally. And sometimes that can be really difficult. Sometimes we want to offer help, we want to relate it back to ourselves. Listening non judgmentally is just that listening with no judgment. And again, if you don't think you can do it, just grab someone else and, and, and let them know what you're thinking. And you know, you might be wrong, the person might be fine. But the main thing is, at least if you ask, they're going to know that someone cares. So number three, what questions should I ask? There are a range of questions, and I'm going to gracious, graciously leave them for Chris to explain, because they are significant. They can be confronting for the first one or two times that you do it. But Chris's experience of having 25 years in the field, I think it's best left for him to explain and touch on that anyway. So when we ask those questions, what's going to happen is we're going to find out if the person's imminent or not. So imminent being they're going to leave and go do something silly, take their own life, or they get, they're just going through a, a tough time. You guys know your resources better than anyone around the area. So, you know, well, who's the GP? Who's the ambulance officers? Who's the police officer? Or, you know, what, what, what's the closest hospital? Because if someone's come to you and says that they're thinking about taking their own life and you need to deal with it immediately, sometimes you need to act fast. And I've done it twice myself. I've had um, two examples where I spoke to, I rang a girl that I hadn't spoken to for a long time. She was in Queensland. And it just so happened her partner had taken his own life because <coughs> she'd been lying with him for three days. And that was just out of the blue. <coughs> so I, after the conversation I was having with her was, she was thinking about taking her own life as well because of what had just happened. And then I hung up and left the phone. When I left that call, I'm like, there's no way I could be near her or get to her in a hurry. So I called triple zero. And because it was a suicide, the police knew where she was, the police went and got her. Now she didn't talk to me for a while because they did take her away because of her mental state, and they did lock her up for two weeks. And she was rather angry with me, but I said, I'd rather you be angry with me than dead. So, the police, when they do go to the to the to the, to the, the scene of the, um, the incident, they're not going to arrest the person. They're just going to have to assist them to take them to get them some help. And there was another time where a gentleman had crushed some pills and he was just about to drink, and we did the same thing. The police gave him the option to get an ambulance. He chose to get the ambulance. He was taken to the hospital. He spent the night in, and he was dismissed. By, uh, what's the word? He was discharged. discharged the the next day. And then the very, very next day after that, he was posting on Facebook how his family come around him again, and he was, he got through that tough spot. So, being in, uh, knowing at, at the minimum, so if someone's if someone's 
imminent, meaning they're going to harm themselves, you know, that you might take those measures. If someone's not imminent, bringing and booking them for, to speak to, the, to, their, to, to go to their, their GP. And if you do know them, their friends, their family, there's nothing wrong with taking them to that appointment, maybe waiting in the waiting room, or just even going in with them, whatever they feel comfortable with, just making sure they get there. If you don't know the person, again, you can make the call for them because you know who they should go and see, give them the appointment. We might not be able to save everyone, but at least we can care a little bit more. Um, and five, debrief. It's really important now, nine times out of 10, you're not the problem that's got the person to that incident. So you're not gonna to wanna to take on all of their problems because that this wouldn't be helpful for our own mental health. Again, so I'm gonna leave this to the twist to explain how a person, or how, you, how you should debrief yourself as an individual so that you don't take on that person's in an unfortunate situation. And the best way to do that, Chris will go through that. Um, and then, this is our contact details. So what you can do, you can go to our beaconfightforlife.org website. You'll find there's a donate button there. We're always looking for funding because we are a startup and we're looking for ways that we can continue to do this. this is, the Beacon Fight for Life is the name of the charity. It's a registered charity. It's fully tax deductible. Um, this is called the Beacon of Light Initiative where we go to the regional areas and do these presentations. And there's also the Fight for Life Festival. We've also just got a new director on board, Rochelle Humes, who works for Chevron. And she's going to do an initiative around helping Aboriginal women. Please feel free to go there. You can like us on Facebook, and we've got, got that handle on Instagram as well. This is my email address if you want to get hold of me. I've got another story about a mate of mine, his name was Tim. Well, his name is Tim, he's still alive. Um, he called me and he, he said, Derek, I command you for the work you're doing in this space. And he shared a story with me. He said his mate rang him at 2 o'clock in the morning to talk to him and he said, mate, it's two o'clock in the morning, ring me at a bloody reasonable time and he hung up to find out that man took his own life. That, and he was, he was the last point of contact. So he says, I know exactly how you feel because I miss the signs too. So what I say to you is, please don't be a Derek. Don't be a Tim. Don't miss the signs. Be aware of the, your surroundings and understand what's going on in other people's lives as best as you can. So I'd like to dedicate this cause to my friend Corinne, Dan and Todd, and every Australian that's going through a struggle at the moment. Thank you.